like most every other language, Python has a statement for iterating across a sequence. In Python, it's called for, the for statement, as it is in many other languages. But Python syntax is quite a bit different from most of the other languages I'm familiar with. The Python for statement starts with the word for, F-O-R, and then you specify some kind of target list. This target list uh, is, sim is exactly the same as we used for parallel assignment. So if you want to review what you can put there, I encourage you to review the video on parallel assignment. After the target list, then you have the keyword in. And this means quite a bit different than the operator in. And then you have an expression list. Followed by a colon. And then a suite. Remember, in Python, a suite can either be on the same line with statements separated by semicolons, or you would indent by four spaces and have statements stacked one on top of the other. Optionally, and I think somewhat uniquely to Python, there is an else block that you can also specify, just like you can for the while loop. What Python does when it executes the for statement is it first evaluates the expression list. This is supposed to return some sort of iterable. Next, it changes that iterable into an iterator using the iter function that we've discussed earlier. Then for each item in that iterator, it will assign the target list to the value. After the target list has been assigned, it will run the suite. And it does this for each item until it runs out of items. When it's run out of items, then it will execute the else block if there is any, and then continue with the statements following the for statement. Note that inside of this suite, you can do a break and continue. And this has a very similar meaning to in the while loop, the break and continue statements. If you break in a for suite, it will immediately exit the loop and continue with the code after the else block. It will skip the else block. If you execute the continue statement, it will go back to the beginning and start with the next item in the iterator. You could think of the for loop as something that looks like this. So you have the for iterator set to iter of this expression list. And then you enter a while loop that will try to get the next value from the sequence. So it'll say the target list is equal to the next item from that iterator. Okay. If there is no more items, then that will raise a stop iteration exception. And so at that point, we will execute the else block. And then we will break out of the while loop. Otherwise, if there is an item, this code will execute successfully and you can execute the uh, for block. And continue and break will have the same meaning as it does in a while loop. These two are practically the same. There's not a lot of difference. The else block is quite rare in a while loop, but it's pretty typical in a for loop. The reason is that typically when you're for loop, you're going to iterate through a sequence and you'd like to know if you've exhausted the items in that sequence or if you've executed a break somewhere in between. Remember, the only way to skip the else block is to execute a, a break statement inside of the for loop. Let me give you an example of why you might want to break out of the um, for loop early and skip the else block. So we can say like for some items and some sequence, if that item matches some kind of value, let's say that item is equal to five, then we'd like to break out. Otherwise, we will print something saying we couldn't find it. This is a pretty typical scenario for using the else block.
we can and we frequently do nest for loops. Let me give you an example of what that would look like and how that would work. So in this code, we're going to have two matrices represented by tuples of tuples. So these are three by three matrices. So the first matrix has the first row of zero, one, and four, the second row of three, two, and eight, and then the third row of one, nine, seven. The second matrix has a row of one, two, one, zero, nine, and two, and three, four, six. And we're going to build up the result. So the result is an empty tuple, and we're going to build up that result by building up each row item by item. So we're going to have the first iter uh, iter uh, we're going to iterate first through the rows. This is the I index. And then we're going to start building a new row for each I that we encounter. And then we're going to iterate across J. This is for each cell in that row. And we're going to extend the row by adding a new tuple with a single item that is just A, I, J, plus B, I, J, and a comma and a parenthesis, like that, okay? After we're done building up that row, then we will extend the result with the tuple added on. Okay. Let's walk through this code very quickly. So I'm going to grab a sticky note to keep track of our variables. So at first we have the result is equal to the empty tuple and then for i in range three, so it creates an iterator and grabs the first value from that iter iterative sequence, which is zero. So i is equal to zero, and then it's gonna execute this for loop. And now we say row is equal to the parentheses, to the empty tuple. And then for j in range three, so by the time we get to this, this code, j is now equal to zero. And then it says row is equal to the row plus this single item tuple where it's a i j plus b i j. So we're gonna take row and we're gonna change that to be a i j, is that zero, zero. So it's zero plus one, okay? And so now row is a, is a tuple with one element. And we finish this block, so we're gonna grab the next value for j, which is gonna be one. And we're gonna do this again. We're gonna increment the row by zero, one, zero, one. So zero, one, zero, one. One plus two is three. So now this becomes a tuple one comma three. And then we get J equals two, and we extend this one more time to be one comma three comma four plus one is five. And then finally, we're gonna extend the row by adding a tuple one three five to the end. So the result now becomes one comma three comma five, and it's a single item in the tuple. If you follow through the code on your own, you'll see how this uh, gradually builds up the matrix into another three by three matrix. It's the sum of the two matrices. Note that some programmers don't prefer to have short names like I and J, but in my case, I think they're ideal for iterating across a loop like this as indexes, indexes into the items that you're iterating across. I think it's fairly clear what I and J mean here. When you're iterating across items in a sequence, oftentimes you want to remember the index of the item. We have the enumerate function that can do, help us do that. Enumerate takes a single iterable as an argument and it returns an iterator. The iterator will return pairs of numbers. It's going to return uh, the index and then the first item. And then when you call next again on it, it's gonna call one and the next item and so on until the items are exhausted. As an example, you might wanna run the following code in your Python um, interactive mode. So E is equal to enumerate and let's say hello, 
comma world. And then if you call next with E, that should give you back uh, zero comma H. And if you call next again, it's going to return one comma E. Okay, I meant to use single quotes. And so on and so forth. The next one will be two comma L and then three comma L, four comma O and so on. You can give that a try for yourself. So in a for loop, this is particularly useful for I comma car in enumerate, let's say hello. And we can do something like print um, the car at I is car. That'll not only tell you the index, but it'll also tell you the character. Let's take an example of finding an item. So we've already looked at the index method, which takes a value and optionally a start and an end index. And we'll tell you where that value first occurs. So in this case, we're going to write our own index function. So we're gonna have values equals one, two, six, five, nine, eleven, 11, and 12. Okay, and we're not just looking for the first odd number, we're looking for the third odd number. So we're going to keep track of how many odds we've seen so far. And then we're going to enumerate over the sequence so that we can remember the index of the item that we see. If that value is odd, we're going to use the mod operator and see if that's equal to 1. If we divide by 2 and the remainder is equal to 1, then it's odd. Then we're going to increment the number of odds that we've seen. And then if we have seen three of those odds, then we will break out of the loop. And then after this, uh, I will be the index. Note that the for loop doesn't uh, destroy the variables after the for block is, is run. They persist afterwards. You have to be careful, however, because if the for loop is never executed once because you're iterating across a empty sequence, then these variables will never be set and you'll get a name error. Okay. We can turn this into a function. So let's call it def uh, third odd. And we'll use the same code, except when instead of breaking out of here, we could return the index. Or we could move the return statement to the very end. Again, we'd have to be very careful if there's no items at all that have that value. So maybe we'd want to return if that item, if we're inside of the for loop, and then if we don't see it, if we don't return by that time, then we'll just raise a value error saying that that item doesn't exist. The for loop is not a panacea. It's very useful for iterating across single loops or for iterating across multiple loops multiple times like we've seen with the matrix example. Sometimes you need to iterate across several sequences but not in a linear fashion. For instance, if you wanted to grab and sort two sequences into a single sequence, and so you're grabbing the smallest sequence from you know, either the left sequence or the right sequence, the for loop really isn't the right answer there. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video and you've learned a little bit how the for statement works and how we actually use it. If you guys have any questions, you can, of course, reach me in the comments below or uh, connect with me on Discord. Have a great day. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you for watching this video on the Theory of Python by Real Physics. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell, like, and share this video. You can find me on Discord or support me on Patreon. Links are in the description below. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.